Justin, we have a podcast. Diving, diving deep. deep. Diving deep into all things Texas. Both on and off the field. Here's Sean Pendergast. And Pro Football Hall of Famer, the General. Sean McClain. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Utopia. Hey everybody, welcome in to Utopia Football Podcast, our first episode of the week with the preseason now in the rear view, fully three games in the books, the Texans winning on Sunday night in New Orleans, 17 to 13, and a lot to get to here as we record on a Monday, and who knows, there may be some roster moves coming down, maybe even as we're recording this podcast, we're just going to roll on here and get you ready for roster cutdowns and begin to get ready for the regular season here on the Utopia Football Podcast. My name is Sean Pendergast, one half of Payne and Pendergast Sports Radio 610, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, the Hall of Famer, our senior columnist at SportsRadio610.com, John McClain. John, how are we doing? I'm doing great. I, I've got ESPN on, and they say the Texans' name is Trout's starting quarterback. I'm stunned. That was uh, big news everywhere, John. Wow. You know, I know stuff is big news because it gets pushed to my phone at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> it's on the ticker on ESPN. Uh, and I know what you're going to say. Anybody with a working set of eyeballs who's been watching Texans games or out of training camp knew that C.J. Stroud was going to be the starter. There is just something about it being named and the graphic being put up by the team that hits people a certain kind of way. Um, so aside from the fact that this was an obvious naming of the starter going on, what are you, your general thoughts, though, about w- the fact that C.J. Stroud, um, I think – to me, so emphatically, I think won this job. I think he earned this job. This isn't something he's getting because he was the second overall pick in the draft. Well, he earned a job, started working with the first team, second week of camp. Anybody that watched him knew he was the starter. Biggest non-story I've ever seen at a Texans training camp. I'm amazed how many members of national media act like there was actually competition down to the official anointing by D'Amico Ryans and I thought he looked a lot better these last two games. He had a good series in each one of them. I can't wait to see more at Baltimore. Can't wait to see how they're going to use the weapons. Like, say, Tank Dale, who uh, hadn't touched the ball but on a punt return since the first game, and it was dynamic. And so I can't wait to see Bobby Slowick's play calling. But uh, they know what Stroud's capable of doing. We know he's going to get blitzed and tested like crazy from the Ravens. And then they should get crushed, but it'll be a great learning experience. What's impressed you the most so far, John, about C.J. Stroud in his brief time as a Texan? You forget that first game, and the second is his accuracy. Uh, in that one drive where he was 5 of 6, 52 yards uh, in the loss to Miami, every pass was perfect. He had one that was dropped, another one that could have been caught by Noah Brown, and in this one, the perfect placement on the deep pass to Nico Collins, corner Lante Taylor made a great play to get a hand on it, but Collins had both hands on it after Taylor pulled his hand away, so he could have caught it. But even though it was incomplete, it was perfect. Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, none of those guys could have thrown that pass better. And then he got good protection from the line, good play fakes because the running game was working. So the pass to Dalton Schultz, quick one over the middle, and the touchdown to Nico Collins. He got time. He uh, Damian Pierce picked up a big blitz, and he threw it perfectly to Collins, so he got everybody fired up. Yeah, I John, when I think of CJ in this this training camp in its totality, I think I think the things that are as advertised with CJ Stroud are yes, the ball placement or accurate. Ball placement seems to be like the new buzzword for accuracy. So we'll call it ball placement because that's what CJ calls it. Ball placement specialist CJ Stroud. I think that I think just the overall maturity of CJ Stroud, how quickly he was able to gain the respect of veteran teammates um, to a man. They all say that he's great in the huddle. He's great in the locker room. Uh, there's a high degree of respect for a player who is so young in his NFL career. Um, so I think those things were as advertised. I think the, the the thing that's impressed me that we saw glimpses of in the Georgia game, but when the scouting reports were being put together on CJ Stroud throughout his collegiate career, it was, okay, what's going to happen when things go off script for C.J. Stroud? Because everything was just so uh, on point and so mechanical with that um, with that Ohio State offense. I mean, guys were just you know running wide open. It was very formulaic. Most of the competition that he was going against was far inferior. Um, I've been really impressed. He's had to scramble. He's had to run. He's had to navigate the pocket quite a bit, either in practice or during these games. 
Um, I've been pretty impressed with his ability to kind of make things up as they go when he needs to on certain plays. And I think, I think, I actually think his legs are going to be kind of an underrated part of his game. Not that he's going to be Lamar Jackson or anything like that, or even Deshaun Watson when it comes to running, you know, Deshaun didn't, you know, he wasn't a running quarterback per se, but he was, he was very athletic and could scramble. I think that part of CJ's game is going to be something that kind of sneaks up on people. So I've been pretty happy. I think the offensive line protects him, John. I think he could have, by rookie standards, a really good season this year. Those those reports about the mobility were about as accurate as people said to me that Deshaun Watson didn't have good arm strength. I went back and looked at his stats, had over 70 yards rushing in one game, over 40 in another, another one. So I don't know what they were looking at. All you had to do was look at the stats to know that he could run when he had to. So that part hasn't surprised me at all. And you're right. He's a rookie. He's going to see things break down. He's going to think he sees them break down. He's going to run quite a bit because all rookie quarterbacks run. All right, so that's C.J. So C.J. Stroud named the starting quarterback, and all three of the quarterbacks taken in the top four, Bryce Young in Carolina, C.J. Stroud, Houston, and Anthony Richardson in Indianapolis. They're all going to be week one starters, and we'll see Anthony Richardson, John, here in week two. I think for two teams that finished in the bottom four of the league last year, I think that's going to be a game that weekend that gets a lot of uh, – Relatively speaking, a lot of attention from folks just because of the battle of two top four, you know, two top four selections going against each other. It will, just like the Carolina game when you have the top two selections going against each other. So that's going to be fun to watch him play Richardson twice. Now, there's a quarterback who's going to run. You know, what he does best is run. And uh, all those guys were up and down in preseason. And uh, Richardson, without Jonathan Taylor, unless he makes a miraculous come back financially and physically is not going to be playing in that game, which should be good news to the Texans defense, but they're going to have to, they're going to have to play him like they play Lamar Jackson and Justin Fields, knowing that he's going to come in, he's going to run a lot. And some of it's going to be by design. John, uh, Anthony Richardson, what I learned this preseason, not a ball placement specialist. (laughs) No, he hasn't been, he didn't have enough experience. He completed 50 something, Percent of his passes, I think 58, that won't cut it in the NFL. A lot of times that happens when you got a big guy with a big arm who wants to show people how far he can throw it and how he can fit it into tight windows. And sometimes those windows close quickly and end up being interceptions. All right, John, let's get to four stock up and four stock down. And we'll do this for the 53 man roster. Four o'clock on Tuesday, Houston time is when the rosters need to get cut down to 53. Now, this we know. Whatever that 53 looks like for the Texans at 4 o'clock on Tuesday, it could look very different come Wednesday after these hundreds of players get put onto the waiver wire. And the Texans basically have their pick of the litter. Pretty much any player that Chicago doesn't want, the Texans could take if they want to on the waiver wire. That's how it works. It goes via last year's draft order. Uh, that Those are the teams that get priority uh, in that order for players that get put onto uh onto waivers so we know that there will be a 53 at four o'clock on tuesday and i would guess john i don't know before we get into specific players four stock up and four stock down if you had to take a stab at it how many players do you think nick casario and D'Amico ryan's wind up plucking off of the waiver wire to swap out on their 53 man roster over those 24 to 48 hours after the cutdown deadline when you have a new staff including new coordinators you're going to have a lot of changes. There are going to be some surprises that we're going to go really wow. And uh, when they make that at three o'clock central, four Eastern, that uh, they'll be constantly changing. I can't wait to see they put on their practice squad because there's guys from 49ers. Sean, we know there's going to be a couple of former Patriots in there that Nick Casario was part of drafting that they're going to look at as well because you know, every time they bring in a player, I look to see where he used to be, and it's amazing how many of them started off with New England. So we got to watch those two. But I think when you new when you have a new coaching staff, there's going to be more than there would have been if say Lovey Smith had come back. So I'm going to say they're going to bring in like five new ones. Yeah, because that's having that high, as you mentioned, having that high waiver claim yeah. is, is it's not what you want. Of course, you want to be last. But at this time of year, that's good. 
No, I mean, John, it's almost like you're operating when you're picking that high in the waiver order. It's almost like you're operating the NFL draft with an eighth, ninth and 10th round. You know what I mean? It's like you're it's it's really like an adjunct to the draft, especially if it's it's guys you scouted and liked that get put out there because, you know, everybody's got their own tastes and things. And there might be guys that get weren't a fit for what they were doing in some place might be a great fit for what uh, D'Amico Ryans wants to do. Um, All right, John. So let's do four stock up and four stock down for the 53 man roster and we'll do the stock up. Let's do for stock up. Let's do guys that we think or maybe bubble guys that we think have made this 53. Who knows? By the time people are listening to this, maybe we'll have been proven wrong based on the cuts. So we caveat everything with we're recording this at about lunchtime on Monday. And then the four stock down will be guys that we think maybe lost a, a roster spot or at the very least have put themselves in a precarious position because I don't think we can do a stock down without mentioning Kenyon Green at some point here. Um, so let's, but let's start with the positive. Let's start with the stock up, four stock up, John. Who are, who's a who's a guy that you think has uh, clinched a roster spot over these last couple of weeks? Uh, a guy you've talked about a lot on this podcast, Mike Boone, the running back. You know, I went back and looked at his career. When he was in Minnesota, he had a start because of an injury in which he met rush for almost 150 yards. And the week before that, he ran for two touchdowns. So he didn't get a lot of playing time in Denver because he was on injured reserve for two years. But Mike Boone has looked good. He can catch. And uh, Dari Gumbawale, if they really want him, they can cut him and put him on the practice squad because nobody else is going to claim him. But Mike Boone has solidified that third spot. And truthfully, he's looked better running the ball in, in preseason than Devin Singletary has. Yeah, now, I'm glad Singlet- you said that. Yeah, now Singletary will be the second back, but at some point Damian Pierce is going to get hurt, and that means Singletary and Boone are going to move up. And if Boone can stay healthy and avoid IR, which he couldn't do with Denver, he'd turn into a tremendous signing by Nick Casario. Well, hold up. Why do you say at some point Damian Pierce is going to get hurt? Why Why? why do you say that? Because he's gonna, not going to stay healthy for 17 games. He missed almost five full games last year. So I'm guessing at some point he's going to get hurt and miss a game. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe so. Over a no, only, only like five guys played 17 games on his team last no, year. No, I, I, I hear you. I hear you. It's, it's, I just <laughs> stating it as if it's fact. It was just funny to me. Um, you're just bitter because you lost your bet to Landry Locker with that with that injury, John. Yeah, that's, we made so many bets since then. I can't keep up. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mike Boone's a good one. John, I'm going to go Xavier Hutchinson, uh, the rookie wide receiver out of Iowa State. We actually had him on the post game show last night. He was great. He was a fun conversation. You can see just in talking to him, man, a lot of these guys you talk to, these young guys, you can really kind of see what, uh, what D'Amico Ryans and Nick Casario are looking for in terms of just the, the, I would say, football character of guys when you talk to them, how important it is to them. Um, Xavier Hutchinson's a guy who was uber productive at Iowa State, put up big numbers at Iowa State, and he's a guy that you saw from the get-go, John, at training camp. He didn't look like a sixth-round pick throughout training camp and certainly didn't look like a sixth-round pick last night when he had four catches for 48 yards, and he had to play on special teams. It was a just a, a fraction of an inch away from being – uh, a fumbled punt. It just happened to hit his arm first when he drove the the defender. As a gunner, he drove the the, the blocker into the Saints punt returner. We asked him about that on the post game show. I asked him about it. Has he ever? You know, when was the last time he played special teams? He said this is the first time he's ever played special teams in his career. But that special teams coach Frank Ross, you know, talks about the technique that he used. You know, to try to push the guy into the into the uh, return guy. So even though it grazed off of his arm, I still think that's something that the coaches probably took a look at and said, man, this is a kid who's making stuff happen, not only as a receiver, but on special teams as well. I think he was probably pretty solidly, uh, maybe not 100%, but I think the possession arrow was pointed towards him making the team. But no question in my mind, he clinched his spot against the uh, Saints on Sunday night. Everybody likes Hutchinson. He had 105 catches at Iowa State last year. And every time he's gotten an opportunity from the off-season program to training camp to preseason, he's capitalized on it. Yep. Uh, all right, John, who's your next stock up making this squad? I'm going to – I'm because there's so few that I think of, I'm going to say a practice squad guy because he's been really good. Okay. Khalil Davis, a, uh, a veteran defensive lineman who had four quarterback hits against Miami. He had a sack, two quarterback hits, two tackles, 
for loss against New Orleans. It doesn't matter if you're playing backups. You're supposed to do your job. He has. I'm guessing he'll end up on the practice squad uh, because, big. you know, I don't think Big Heine's going anywhere. Kurt Heine, he's gotten a lot of playing time, and he makes plays. But no defensive lineman has made more plays than Khalil Davis in preseason. Yeah, I was a little nervous about a couple of the plays he made last night on Jake Heiner, that if it was a different officiating crew, there might have been a yellow, some <laughs> yellow laundry on the field. He was lighting up. Uh, Jake Hayner, the Saints quarterback last night in that game. There's going to be some interesting cuts on that defensive line, John, both at the defensive end position, but especially that tackle position, because we know Malik Collins, uh, Sheldon Rankins, and uh, Hassan Ridgeway are all going to make the team. Those are veterans that they either signed as free agents or in the case of Malik Collins, gave a big extension to. So they're obviously on the team. And then we, you got Big Heine, you got Roy Lopez. You're right, Khalil Davis has done some things. Um, you know, Thomas Booker was a draft pick last year. I don't think he's making the team. I think they're going to the, – my guess is he winds up back on the practice squad um, this year. So there's there's going to be some some interesting decisions to be made. And Heinish is interesting, John, to me. I Like you look at him physically, and I feel like I feel like it's why he was undrafted. Like I think a lot of teams look at him and go, well, look at him. That's, that guy's not a guy that makes plays. He's just a big, heavy guy that you stick in the middle there. But at least a couple, two, three times a game, there's a play made in the backfield, and you look up, and 93 is in on the play. He's around the ball. Like, he is a guy who's just got a really good, I think, a really good football sense that served him well throughout his entire career, not just with the Texans. I'm amazed at how many times you guys are getting up from the bottom of the pile and Big Heine's on the bottom. Yeah, it's the Big Heine's on the bottom, John. We need some merch. Big Heine on the bottom. <laughs> uh, all right, my last stock up. Um, and I don't know if this guy is going to make the team, but they signed him last week, a uh, third round pick in 2020 cornerback. Uh, Cam Dantzler made a huge play to close out that game last night. That wasn't just a right place, right time kind of play. Um, that was a play where he might have baited Jake Hayner into the throw that was picked off. He certainly made a hell of a catch on the play. I mean, that was like a physical talent kind of thing. That was a wide receiver catch. John. That was a DeAndre Hopkins kind of catch on that interception by Dantzler to close out the game. I think cornerbacks are really interesting position, John. I think Stingley, I think uh, Stephen Nelson, I think Desmond King, to me, are the only locks to make this team. I don't think Tavier Thomas has had a good training camp. Uh, I don't think Shaquille Griffin has been exactly what they hoped they were getting with him. Um, so I think there's guys like Kadar Holman. I think there's guys like Cam Dantzler, um, that, that maybe Kobe Francis. I, I think that... Outside of the top three cornerbacks, I think anything can happen at that position. Dantzler is a guy who has third-round talent and was a really good player for Minnesota early on in his career. And to see him make that play to close out that game, he's a big kind of long athlete. Um, I think he 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 may have he he may have come in week before the season and got a spot on this fifty-three. If I had to pick a surprise, I'd pick it our Holman. But thing about Tavier Thomas, I've seen a lot of people spe in the media speculating about him not making it. Last year, he was only judged by pro football focus as being the best slot corner in the NFL. So if they did waive him, he would get a job in a heartbeat. It'd be easier to waive one of those other guys and put him on a practice squad. But they're definitely top-heavy with corners. The backup safeties, MJ Stewart and Eric Murray had to play a lot in the preseason. and uh, But it's a good problem to have in which the Texans might have too much talent and might have to cut somebody they don't want to cut. Do they only have four safeties on the team, John? I mean, uh, Eric Murray, Eric Murray, and MJ Stewart were in at the end of the game yesterday. Like, the, like, do they have any safeties outside of Petrie, Ward, and the other and, and Murray and Stewart on this? They team? only have four that they want. That's pretty obvious. As much playing time as yes. those guys got, yeah. now they could get somebody off the wire because yeah. there's going to be a lot of players who were drafted high, and I'm not talking about first and second, but third round picks like Dantzler, uh, who are going to be available. And, yep. and it, and, and they, and Chicago can't claim them all. You know, the bears think they're going from worst to first mm -hmm. and they must think they actually have a good roster instead of the one that was so pathetic last year. Uh, but I think it's going to be so much fun to see who the Texans keep and guys they let go are going to get jobs quickly with other teams. Let's do four stock down, John. You go first. What's your first stock down? Last year's 15th overall pick, Kenyon mm -hmm. Green, demoted to the second team, gave up a terrible sack, got hurt, came out, stood on the sideline. He's just been a huge bust to this point. Now, he can come back and turn it all around, but it's scary 
He's, he should be in shape after missing so much of the off-season program. He should be doing better at this point. But he just got abused on that sack. It was embarrassing. And then he grabbed his arm where he got hurt. But, man, Michael Dieter didn't start a game last year, and he's just starting left guard. Give me yeah. a break. Maybe he'll end up being Josh Jones, even though he's a better tackle. He started, I think, nine games at left guard. But, boy, uh, left guard is a problem created by Kenyon Green. And if he busts, that would be a terrible decision by Nick Casario and Lovey Smith a year ago. Yeah, that's not trending in the right direction. John, I'm never a fan of taking guards with the 15th overall pick. I just That's a position to me that the ceiling on the impact that a guard can have on your team, to be taking them 15th overall where there's every year inherently there's guys that just play bigger impact positions out there than 15th overall. I mean, you, 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 better, be, you, know, you, you better be John Hanna you know, to, to, to conjure up an old school hall of fame name. <clears throat> um, if you're drafting a guard with the 15th overall pick, I just, I, even if, even if Kenny Green had stayed healthy and was an average NFL player right now, to me, that's just a poor use of resources. Um, my first stock down is one that you texted me about last night. So maybe I'm stealing it from you, but Austin, you didn't say this, but I'll say it. Austin bleeping Deculus. Does he does he allowed to get the bleeping, John? He was a six of round course. rookie last year. Of course. But he's from the area here. So we root for him because he's a Houston kid. But man, he I mean, he struggled mightily against the Patriots in that first game. And he has just really, really struggled. He's a big kid who, you know, if you just watch him step off the bus, you go, oh, Yeah, I, I can see where that kid's a tackle. And then you watch him move in this in throughout this training camp, and it just hasn't been good. Nick Casario is going to be doing something, John, here over these next 24 hours that he has not done to this point, and that is cut players that he himself has drafted. He's never cut one of his own draft picks before, not because he's in love with them or anything like that, but because this roster had that much building to do. There's enough quality players in the building now where there's no scraps in his scrapbook. I think I think uh, Austin Deculus is one of a small handful of guys that Nick Casario has handpicked that could be gone. He is my first stock down and for that reason if they like him in practice then they can always put him on the practice squad because i can't see anybody no. claiming him based on the tape they would have seen in this preseason that's right and I, and I think if they claim that if they claim him they have to put him on the 53 right if another team claims him if claims him off waivers i believe right uh if another team claims him then then he's got it if if another team claims him they've got him yeah. Under any circumstances. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Who's your next stock down, John? Well, it uh, you don't catch punts on the two yard line. Steven Sims, who mm -hmm. shouldn't be returning punts, Tank Dell should have for obvious reasons. He got a punt on the two, maybe it was a three, I forget, but I remember going, oh my God, he shouldn't be doing that. He's a, he's a guy should have more sense than that. And then he also he made a really good catch on the sideline. For a big game, but he pushed off. It was offensive pass interference. Uh, the only reason they would keep him is if indeed they wanted him to return punts and kickoffs, but Frank Ross should not want him to return punts because that should be Tank Dell. Yeah, I don't want him on the roster because I don't want any temptation to not have Tank Dell returning punts on this. Absolutely. Team. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm with you on on Steven Sims. Um John, my last one is uh, a guy who has not gotten on the field at all, really, throughout training camp, who's been on this team the last couple of years, and it's Christian Kirksey. I think Christian Kirksey is going to be gone amidst what is a – I don't know how good the linebacker position is on the Texans, but it is a competitive situation. There's a lot of bodies at that linebacker spot. And I think you'll probably end up keeping five, six at the most linebackers, <clears throat> and the musical chairs fill up pretty quick. Denzel Perryman is going to make this team. Christian Harris is going to make this team. Blake Cashman's been injured, but before he got injured with this hamstring, he was running with the ones and having a really productive training camp, and he's a very good special teams player as well. Henry Toa Toa is somebody that this coaching staff <clears throat> really likes, even though it's gotten to be a bit more of a struggle for him these last couple games, but he's going to make this team. And then you've got Corey Littleton and Neville Hewitt and Jake Hansen, and I'm probably missing a couple. Garrett guys. Wallow. Garrett Wallow, yeah. And I like I don't know that Garrett, Garrett Wallow might be a Casario draft pick that gets cut. There's no way that Christian Kirksey can make this team. If you're doing a 53-man mock roster and you're putting Kirksey on here just because he's a big, I say big name, you know, he's he's a, a known name that's been on this team the last couple of years. He's been on this team because of the leadership quality. He hasn't been on this team because he's a good football player. 
Now he's just injured, old, expensive, and they got plenty of leadership in the building. They don't need any more of these guys that can't play hanging around just because they're good pros and good locker room guys to teach the young guys. They've they've got their, the the culture foundation is established now. Christian Kirksey, here's your gold watch. See you later. I'd keep Neville Hewitt. I know the coaches like Hewitt. He and Kirksey are interchangeable. He's been there every day. Kirksey hasn't through no fault of Kirksey's, but you got to be healthy, especially when you're in his situation. And if they do get rid of him, is it 5.6 million? They save something like that. Yeah, that's a lot. It's seven million. Cap. It is a really good cap savings. If they go get rid of him and that's actually kind of going to be a tough, a tough decision uh, because those guys play special teams. And Henry Toto, I think, you know, they're trying to get him to play outside and inside. They, you know, let the poor kid play the position he was drafted to play in the middle, find somebody else to play outside. You got Blake Cashman, and he will be the starter when he's healthy. But let I don't like moving rookies around. I remember when they did that to Xavier Suofilo, first pick in the second round in 14, he turned out to be a buzz, one of many in the offensive line. And so let Tua Toa play the middle behind uh, Denzel Perryman. All right, John, I've got five for real or fugazis for you. You ready? Ready. Okay, here's how it works if you're new to the podcast. This is one of our favorite segments to do. And, John, by the way, I think the people that we uh, presented to and did the podcast for at the Houstonian, by the way, shout out to Steve Frunnerhaus in the Houstonian. We had a great event there last Thursday. We should have mentioned that off the top, thanking him for that. I think they enjoyed For Real or Fugazi. I think it played well to a live crowd, John. We got great feedback on that. By the way, anybody listening, if you're interested in the Utopia Football Podcast coming on the road to your event, let us know. Where can they send a message, John? They can send it to, I think send it to our mailbag, John. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. It's the easiest yeah. place. We had a blast doing it, and we want to do it again. Yep, absolutely. It was so much fun. We had a great time. So that's something we're looking to do more of, um, if not this season, then certainly as next season approaches. But we we had a great time, and as you mentioned, the food was good and the feedback was great, and it was a fun night out at the Houstonian. So thank you to Steve Frunterhouse and the whole staff at the Houstonian, and certainly all of you that, that paid your hard-earned money to come out there and listen to John and I chop it up. Uh, about the uh, upcoming football season. All right, here's the way for real if Fugazi works. I read a sentence to John. He uh, determines whether or not he agrees with it. If he does, he says, that is for real. If he disagrees with it, if he thinks I'm crazy, he says, Fugazi. Fugazi, that's Italian for counterfeit, fake, or Sean doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. All right, here we go, John. I've got five of them. Two Texans related, one general NFL, an Astros, and then a uh, general interest one at the end here. Uh, as far as the Texans go, the Texans have been mathematically eliminated from the postseason by the beginning of December, each of the last three seasons. For real or Fugazi, the 2023 season will be considered a rousing success if they're on the list of teams still in the hunt on those playoff graphics on TV on December the 1st, regardless of how the season ultimately ends. Uh, sure, why not? That would be an accurate barometer because nobody's counting on it. And because it has been so long since they've been on those graphics, but I think if they could be, then uh, that would be a great sign about the progress they've made. So, John, that is? For real. For real. Thank you very much. All right. Um, you know what? I'm going to do a bonus one here just because I think I think this will get me a, a fugazi. Kenyon Green has been abjectly terrible since he was drafted, and last night he was running with backups. For real or fugazi, the Texans should cut Kenyon Green by Tuesday at 4 o'clock. Fugazi, I would never give up on a former first-round pick after one training camp because I've seen several players in my career bomb out the first two years and then turn into really good players in the third year. Usually you better do it in the second year, especially if you're a number one pick. But I, I probably what will have that to do with that is how he's been working behind the scenes. Has he been working hard? Is he doing everything he's supposed to do? Is his weight under control if he's doing everything they ask him to do they'll keep him if he's not they'll get rid of him and do like uh, the 49ers did with trey lance just admit they made a mistake bonus for real or fugazi Kenyon green is in a different uniform in 2024 um fugazi maybe it's just because i hope that he'll okay. still be here and it'll work yeah. out so i'm going to say he'll still that'll be his third season but he better not be a backup because anybody's you guess. don't keep highly 
highly paid backups. No, indeed. No, indeed. All right, um, John, here we go. Damian Pierce and Will Anderson did interviews with Aaron Andrews on the Fox broadcast that uh, left the Fox crew gushing about the personality of this team. Did you see those interviews, John? Absolutely. They were gushing about them afterwards, the, the Fox team. For real or for Gazy, those Pierce and Anderson interviews were the best national TV PR the Texans have gotten since J.J. Watt was in the building. Absolutely, for real, when it comes to not playing on the field. And they purposely gave them to people they knew would be good. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that Will Anderson said it was nice meeting Aaron Andrews and thanking her profusely, the Fox people just ate it up. So you couldn't have put two better guys out there for that situation. Like you wouldn't want to put Davis Mills out there. John, you know, he yeah. Goes, Davis has no – he has a personality, but he goes out of his way not to show it. But <laughs> yeah. Pierce is always a great interview, even for a different reason for than Will Anderson. Because, as you know, Damian Pierce will say just about anything. Yeah, well, that was a dial back version of Pierce they got. I, you know, like that was Seth and I were talking about that this morning. I thought, I mean, Damien's always great, but like just as far as like what peak Damien is, that was like a B minus last night. You know, he had a couple good lines. He was really focused on what was going on on the field, which I guess should, in a way, make it sort of a B plus or an A minus because it was just funny to see him get distracted by stuff going on on the field during a preseason game that he wasn't playing in at that point. You know, he was just on the sidelines watching. Um, both of those guys, John, you know, we we had Damian on the postgame show probably two or three times last year, Clint Sterner and I did, and we had Will Anderson on the postgame show after the Dolphin game uh, a week and a half ago. They're both like that, John. They're both shake your hand, look you in the eye, address you by name, that nice to meet you. Um, they're they're real. They're not, they're not just sincere guys. I mean, they legitimately have big personalities too. I was texting Omar Majoub, our friend who uh, handles PR for the Texans, and I said uh, in the fourth quarter, I said, just go ahead and send him Jimmy Ward and run up the score here with personality. You already gave him Pierce and Will Anderson. Give him Jimmy Ward now. And then, then the Texans might, Texans might end up being the favorite team of everybody in the United States at that point, John. Yeah, unfortunately for them, it's the last time they're going to be doing any interviews on national I know, TV. I know, I know. At least they maximized their minutes, as my friend they Jim sure Rock did. did. Absolutely. All right, John, Another. I got three more for you here. Uh, the Patriots have not picked. How about this stat, John? The Patriots have not picked in the top five in the NFL draft since 1994. For real or Fugazi, that changes this year. The Patriots will be picking in the top five in the 2024 NFL draft. Fugazi, I think they'll be picking in the top ten. I saw a very respected NFL writer who's covered the league forever last week have the Patriots winning the AFC East. And I lost all respect for him. Uh, okay. Are you going to name names, John, or do I have to no, go No, I can't do that. Him? I don't want to embarrass him. Now, if they win the division, I'll I'll, I'll unveil him. I'll, I'll put it like this. I will say he's a genius on the Utopia Football Podcast. But right now, I don't know how anybody in their right mind could pick the Patriots to win that division. John, a little trivia for you. Do you know who the team – that it's gone the has gone the longest without picking in the top five in the NFL draft. Uh, let me think a second. Uh, well, uh, um, well, if it's not the Patriots, who is it? The Pittsburgh Steelers. Wow. You know that the last sense. time. You know the last time. You know what play? You know what player they selected the last time they picked in the top five in the NFL draft? Uh, was it 1974? 1970, Terry Bradshaw. Holy smoke. Even So he had the greatest draft in history in 1974. Right. Swan, Stallworth, Lambert, and Webster. Yeah. Donnie Shell was an undrafted free agent. They're all in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Going back to 70, that is incredible. I haven't picked them in the top five. Stat. Texans picked twice in the top five two months ago. <laughs> the Steelers haven't <laughs> Steelers haven't picked in the top Steelers haven't picked in the top five since uh, since uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson was the president <laughs> or, or Nixon or whoever was the president back in 1970. So, anyways, uh, that I thought you did. I thought you'd enjoy that little bit of trivia. Well, that was there. a great one. Yeah. Um, all right, John. Uh, Jordan Alvarez has not hit a home run in nearly three weeks. For real or Fugazi, even though he hasn't, Alvarez is still the player the Astros can least afford to lose come October. Uh, I agree for real because uh, he's capable so much. He gets a lefty's great. 
you know, or I might see Kyle Tucker any other time, but boy, if they make the playoffs and for the stretch drive, they need Alvarez because he's capable of going deep anytime he swings the bat. But, you know, he's not hit with power since he came back, but the guy that's more mystifying, Jeremy Pena had yeah. five hits in the destruction of the Tigers on Sunday. Hasn't hit a home run since July 5th. Yeah. And he had 22 last year before he had the great playoff in World Series. He had 10 on July, whatever it was you just said. I mean, he was he was on his way. to He was on pace for 2025 20, this year. Um, you're right. Yeah, it's been – well. Thankfully, we got Yiner Diaz and Chaz McCormick making up the shortfall for those two guys. They've combined for 38. Yep. It's, it's Imagine what they do if they've been playing full time. John, some of the numbers on Chaz, like where he ranks in certain advanced stats in baseball, it's like you – I was reading an article, an article about this 10 minutes before you and I started recording today about Chaz, and they show like the top five – I mean, these are advanced stats, like weighted runs created, um, you know, the uh, X woba like all these different things. But all I know – not to go too nerdy here, but all I know is that the names that he is surrounded by in these rankings for stuff are names like Freddie Freeman and and, and Aaron Judge. <laughs> you know, got like elite, elite guys. Um, Chaz is having some, he's having some sort of year, man. I saw a great graphic uh, on Sunday. It said last year, everybody in the media was going crazy over Adley Rushman and his rookie of the year candidacy at this time. And he put up his stats. In Yiner's stats, in Yiner in the part-time role, he had him in – Yiner's got him in everything. And the point the guy made was nobody's talking about Yiner Diaz. Well, the reason is he's a backup catcher. Yeah, that's – okay. Don't get me Unfortunately. Don't get me started on that. Um, all right, last one, John. Bob Barker passed away this past week at the age of 99. For real or fugazi, Bob Barker is the greatest game show host of all time. I would have to say for real, uh, Trayback was a great one. Uh, Gene Rayburn forever. Richard Dawson was great, but nobody had Bob Barker's longevity or success. And uh, none of them lived as long either. No, no. But, and, and dude lived a good life, man. Barker's beauties. It was, uh, that was, that was some good stuff. John, my, uh, my Mount Rushmore of, Game show host. You just named a few good ones that don't make like Gene Ray. Gene Rayburn doesn't make my Mount Rushmore, but his his iconic long microphone that he had on Match Game, I feel like should be retired in the Smithsonian or something, right? That was in the seventies, and the sexual innuendo oh. they had on that show, they get run off the air today. I don't know, John. Have you okay? Have you watched Family Feud, the 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 modern version now with Steve Harvey? No, because I like Richard Dawson so much, I refuse to watch it today. You, John, Steve Harvey. Okay, because Steve Harvey, my Mount Rushmore is Bob Barker, Alex Trebek, Pat Sajak, Wheel of Fortune. Yes, He's had right. a good run. And Steve Harvey's on mine because I'm supremely entertained by him on Family Feud. I have to have some modern person on there, John. I say modern. Steve Harvey's like in his early 60s, but he's hilarious. I'm, I like Richard Dawson, too. But Richard Dawson would get me to the hell out of town with his act on Family Feud now <laughs> with all the kissing and everything else. Like he would get me to the hell out of here. But that's that's my Mount Rushmore. But it sounds like you would replace sounds to me, John, like you would replace Harvey with Dawson and you would replace Sajak with Rayburn if you were doing your Mount Rushmore. Uh, no, I actually I would take Sajak over Rayburn because of longevity. Yeah. But I would replace uh, Steve Harvey. I've never liked him. And I love, I absolutely love Richard Dawson okay, as a yeah. guest, uh, as a guest on the match game where almost every answer had some kind of sexual connotation yeah. and they had women on there yeah. that would have sexual connotations. Oh yeah. And you're right today. They couldn't be on the air, but, uh, I love Pat Sajak and Vanna like White. Yeah, I, I do too. And, and Sajak's retiring this year. He's, he is. Uh, He's, he's retiring, and Vanna wants more money now. Do you know Vanna White's been making the same salary for the last, like, 18 years? She hasn't gotten she a raise. She needs a new agent. She does. You see, you saw that story, too. She's been making yeah. three – she's been making the same – I mean, granted, it's $3 million a year to flip some letters around, so it's not like she's got a – you know, it's not like she leaves the studio and then grabs her tin cup full of pencils <laughs> so she can pay the light bill or anything like that. But but she's – how do, how do you not get a raise, at least cost a living, right? Uh, Maybe she point. doesn't have an agent. Maybe she's done it herself. Okay. Well, she's not doing a very good job, John. No. Like um, so, anyways, uh, yeah, so that's uh, 
Bob Barker, RIP. Do you have a favorite game on Price is Right, John? Like a favorite pricing game that they played on there? Uh, uh, no, not not one in particular. I was thinking about a couple of other of my favorite shows. Bob Eubanks on the dating game. Yeah, that's good. Uh, he was hilarious. Was you talk about sexual innuendo? My mm -hmm. God. Mm. And uh, but no, I don't have any any one in particular. Do you like the uh, the newlywed game too? Did you like that one? I love the newlywed <laughs> game. That was great. Yeah, I love. I used to watch those shows all the time when I was young, and then when I got in this business, sports writing business, and didn't have to go to work every day till four o'clock, so I had a lot of time to sit around and watch game shows. Dude, if I had if I had a dime, if I had a dime for everybody I saw tweet the day that Bob Barker died about how. They that's what they watched when they faked being sick and stayed home from school. <laughs> and that was me. Oh, man. Like 10 a.m. CBS <laughs> every day. All right. So there you go. That was for real or Fugazi. Fun to get a little Bob Barker talk. By the way, Plinko is my favorite Price is Right game where they take the chips and they drop them and they go down the pegs. Yeah, that's Plinko is the best. And the Yodler guy. The Yodler guy going up the cliff. <laughs> Those are my favorites. <laughs> All right. Um H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. That's how you get in touch with us. And we'll do a mailbag episode on Wednesday. By then, John, we'll know what the 53, I'll, I was going to say looks like. Probably more appropriate if we're recording Wednesday to say we'll know what the 53 looked like because they may have already made some moves <laughs> by then. But but my point is this is going to be a, a 24 to 48 hour period with a lot of moving parts for the Texans, right? Can you imagine the airlines, everybody's making last minute reservations to travel crisscross the country going for tryouts it's going to be a mess but and chaos like you mentioned but it's going to be so much fun yep should be a lot of fun and we're under two weeks away from the season opener this will be the longest 13 days ever for those of us waiting for real football but there's no shortage of stuff for us to talk about uh starting next week we're going to go to three episodes a week uh in advance of week one just Two more episodes just one more this week so two this week so we got a mailbag episode on wednesday hou mailbag at gmail.com if you want to drop us an email for Wednesday's episode. Be sure to do that. John, I enjoyed this as always, my friend. Thank you, and it was fun at the Houstonian. If anybody's interested in the Utopia football mailbag coming to your event, let us know. Bring it to us, man. H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. Uh, for our producer, James Jackson, who does a great job getting this podcast out to all of you, we thank him. You all should thank him as well. Uh, hit that subscribe button. That's the best way you can thank us is hitting the subscribe button and making sure that podcast gets to you automatically on whatever device it is that you listen to your podcast or whatever uh, app or website that you go to. Subscribe, give us a review. We love that. And we appreciate everybody tuning in and downloading this podcast. The season's almost here. This is going to be a whole lot of fun with CJ Stroud and D'Amico Ryans leading this new era of Texans football. So for the Hall of Famer, John McClain and our producer, James Jackson, I'm Sean Pendergast. We are out of time. We will see all of you in a couple of days here for a mailbag episode of the Utopia Football Podcast. Until then, thanks for listening. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest updates. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.